Unloading and loading refers to um, the binding and unbinding of, of oxygen to hemoglobin. Loading occurs in the lungs when the hemoglobin is exposed to the oxygen as it diffuses from the alveoli into first the plasma and then into the red blood cells. If you take a look at the figure on the right, you can actually see in this figure a diagram um, presenting that where here we have the alveoli that I'm going to color here in turquoise. And from there, we're going to see the diffusion of that oxygen molecule into the plasma. About 2 to 3 percent of it will stay there in that plasma as being dissolved. And that's, by the way, our, if we were to measure that 2 to 3 percent, that's our, our 0.3 milliliters per 100 milliliters in terms of concentration. Some of that, though, will continue. And again, remember that oxygen is, a, is perfectly capable of dissolving or passing through a plasma membrane. It has no problem with that. So by simple diffusion, some of that oxygen is going to pass through into the red blood cell where it will encounter hemoglobin and become that oxyhemoglobin molecule that we discussed. It remains in that red blood cell bound to the hemoglobin. Now remember that this is a reversible reaction. So every now and then one of these oxygen molecules is going to pop right back off of the hemoglobin and go back into the plasma. And so we'll have this cycle essentially that is occurring. But when our, uh, as long as our plasma concentration is at 0.3 milliliters per 100 milliliter of oxygen, most of it, most of that chemical reaction is going to favor the formation of the oxyhemoglobin. As we travel to the tissues though, recall that the tissues begin to use oxygen. And so that oxygen that is dissolved in the plasma is going to be fished out of the plasma and drawn into um, the cell. Oxygen concentration in the cell is relatively low. compared to the oxygen concentration in the plasma. And it remains low because once oxygen is present, it'll be sh shuttled, or actually it's not really shuttled, it diffuses into the mitochondria, and in the mitochondria it grabs up the electrons from the electron transport chain, it's that final electron receptor, um, acceptor. And again, you know, if you're rusty on that, go back and revisit that electron transport process. Um, and in, as oxygen grabs up those electrons from the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, it produces water. So the oxygen levels are constantly re kept low within the tissues because that oxygen is used up. And therefore, that actually favors, if we were to look at this, Again, notice my equation has been rewritten, but uh, it's been rewritten, so it's still reversible, right? But because now my concentration of oxygen is supposed to be 3 milliliters per 100 millimeter, milliliters, that's where we're at our stable, energetically favor, favorable point. But as that drops, and it doesn't need to even drop very much, maybe it's going to drop to 0.29 uh, or 0.28 then that favors the movement of this chemical reaction, this oxygen, oxygen plus, let me just rewrite it to make sure you're clear on that, the um, O2 plus hemoglobin, those are my reactants, gives me, I've had too much caffeine today, my hand's shaky, so it's really ugly writing. Oh no! All right, my oxyhemoglobin levels, and then of course that's reversible. So up here, it favors the production of the oxyhemoglobin. But down here, it actually pushes that reaction in the other direction to favor the production of oxygen that is free. And that oxygen that is free will diffuse right back into the plasma and be sucked into um, the tissues.
based on the needs of the tissues. I say sucked in, but it's just diffusion. It's not like we're actively using energy or anything, but the diffusion favors the movement down the concentration gradient. And so because there is a concentration gradient, oxygen will move steadily into the cell and then it gets used up. So that's oxi that concentration gradient is always existing. It's always there. And that brings us to something called the oxygen dissociation curve, or you can also sometimes call this o the oxygen saturation curve. It kind of depends on the textbook uh, and as on slightly on how the information is presented to you, but the concept is the same regardless of what the name is. And what this looks at is, well, it's essentially going to look at energy. It, it's a lot of things that go into this graph. It's the favorability of uh, the energetic favorability of this equation, this oxygen plus hemoglobin giving me the hemoglobin bound to oxygen and vice versa. And you can do all sorts of mathematical calculations and calculate various different values that are interesting aren't only to a pharmacologist. For now, what I want you to look at is, is this graph. And when we are, look at, look at the x-axis. Always look at the axis, okay? So notice we're gonna have two, we have the x-axis here, and on the x-axis is my partial pressure of oxygen, okay? Now my y-axis has two different labels. On the right, we have the percent oxyhemoglobin saturation. And on the, I'm sorry, on the left, we have the percent oxyhemoglobin saturation. And on the right, we have the oxygen content. So this would be the content in the plasma, okay? And as we look at this, one of the things I want you to notice is the shape of this curve. And we are, uh, you know, I want you to see this curve. It's what we call a sigmoidal shape. You kind of have to use your imagination a little bit, but it's more S-like versus other types of saturation curves that might look more like that, okay? This sigmoidal shape simply represent, or it's actually significant in the sense that what ends up happening is small changes in partial pressure, at least in this range. Let me highlight this range. Let me color it in a little bit more. Within this range lower here, high concentrations or, or small concentration changes in that partial pressure of oxygen will have a big effect on how the hemoglobin loads or how the hemoglobin unloads, I should say. Okay, unloads. Okay. And it also gives us this curve here. Let me find another softer color to use with it. I guess we'll use pink, that'll work. Um, up here in this upper region here, notice that the curve is much less steep. Okay, much less steep. And so this will actually, again, it has to do with unloading, but you'll see that we actually have a fairly large range from here to here, where blood oxygen levels or hemoglobin, or sorry, oxyhemoglobin levels are relatively stable, okay, relatively stable. And that's between the partial pressure of 40 and 100. And if you think way back, in fact, let's go ahead and flip way, way back. Where is the figure that I want? That'll do. Notice that my partial pressure, at least at rest, of oxygen in the venous blood is going to be about 40 millimeters of mercury or lower. Okay. And so that's important and that's relevant in that we can see that within normal resting values, Okay, we have a fairly good stability um, in terms of how much oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin. At 100 millimeters of mercury, our saturation level, it shows on this graph 100%, but recall that it's not really ever going to be 100%. Uh, it's actually going to be 98%, maybe 
okay so this point right here I'll, I'll make it a really big circle that is my 97 98 percent um, it really never reaches a hundred percent due to the saturability the saturation um, or the solubility I should say of oxygen there's always going to be at least a little bit dissolved in the bloodstream and then notice even over here in the veins we still have a pretty good amount of oxygen bound to that hemoglobin we have less than we did but we still have a pretty good amount and so uh, we have essentially this reserve in that even if we were to hold our breath for a little while and not get fresh oxygen into our alveoli our hemoglobin still is going to be carrying quite a bit of oxygen for us and we don't become really distressed until we reach a much lower partial pressure of oxygen in our bloodstream for the um, but now let's think about what happens when our skeletal muscles start to work hard well when our skeletal muscles start to work hard as we've talked before that oxygen is going to begin to be depleted and so if we were working tremendously hard let's just say for sake of example we might see our partial pressure of oxygen drop to 20 because well because of this because we're drawing it into the tissues right here and so since our partial pressure of oxygen might drop into 20 to 20 let's say well now we might actually see a situation where um, my percent saturation is down to 40 let's just say as an example and so this actually is evolutionarily brilliant um, in that you know f we've got this perfect protein molecule that allows us to hold on to oxygen when we're at rest and then very quickly dump that oxygen or unload that oxygen when we're working hard and so we have this reserve that we can quickly tap into when we need it and I kind of love that okay I kind of really love how beautifully that works now going further on and, and yes I know that this is a little bit longer a lot of this I talked about already so I'll just kind of point out some things and you can read and highlight on your notes as you desire this S shape is what we call that sigmoidal shape that I was talking about I'll let you read the rest of this but I want to go to here okay remember for me that when skeletal muscle is working hard that skeletal muscle is producing a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide in addition remember that the byproduct of chemical reactions is heat so as myosin I know it's been a while, right? It, it, a lot of times it seems like it's a whole year ago that we studied skeletal muscle. It really wasn't. But it'll feel like that to you. Um, myosin is an enzyme. And as that enzyme catalyzes the chemical reaction, it breaks ADP, ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that is an exergonic reaction that releases energy it's that energy release that we need to catalyze the movement the ratcheting effect that power stroke to cause skeletal muscle to re, um, to contract actually it catalyzes the ratcheting of of myosin into the cocked position and then phosphate leaving causes it to go exercise uh, execute the power stroke each of those are a chemical step each of those are could be considered a chemical reaction and chemical reactions ex exergonic chemical reactions release heat and so as your muscles are working hard not only are they producing carbon dioxide they're also producing heat and so we're flooding the blood with carbon dioxide and look at this of course carbon dioxide as you know carbon dioxide by combines with water if you haven't memorized this quick equation already then you really need to memorize it to produce my carbonic acid which dissociates into my hydrogen ion plus my bicarbonate ion 
right? And so the CO2 being produced by the, mu the muscles um, produces more hydrogen ion. And this is cool. Hydrogen ion affects hemoglobin. Okay? That might seem like a bad thing, right? Oh no, we've got this hemoglobin changing shape slightly because the blood has become acidic. But it also actually, again, kind of plays into this beautiful mechanism that we have where hemoglobin will load with oxygen very easily at high partial pressures of oxygen. And it will dump that oxygen, unload that oxygen at low pressures of oxygen. And the acidity of the skeletal muscles helps out. Look at this. At a normal blood pH, okay, my normal blood pH, 7.4, here's my graph. And that's really the same as, as this one. It, it's a slightly different presentation, but it's the same. So that when we're up here, we're at about, let's see, let's find my 100. Okay, here's my 100. Okay, when I'm up here, I'm about 98% saturated. Okay, or 97%, take your pick. But now, as my skeletal muscles are working out really hard, this is a little bit of an exaggeration. You're probably not going to drop down to 7.2, but locally you might. As a system-wide, you're not going to drop that low because that could cause a serious problem. But locally, in the working skeletal muscles, you could. And so as that local change occurs and the pH drops to 7.2, let's notice at the top there's only a small shift. So maybe right here it's, um, let's follow that over, instead of 98% saturated, maybe I'm at about 94%. That's not a big change, okay? Not a big change. But down here, let's look at this one. Let's go to, we'll just compare 40% for sake of argument. So I'm sorry, 40 millimeters of mercury oxygen. When oxygen is at a partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury, when we're at a pH of 7.2, our oxygen oxyhemoglobin levels are about 60%. But when we're at our normal 7.4, our oxyhemoglobin levels are closer to 75%. And so you can see that the presence of acid makes unloading more efficient. We call this the Bohr effect, and we also would refer to this as being a shift to the right. The curve shifted to the right. So if this is normal, this is the new normal, okay, with the 7.2, and so that would be a rightward shift. Notice what happens if we're, our blood is alkaline, okay? Um, so the local effect of, of acid building up and temperature building up in the skeletal muscles is a good thing because it helps with the unloading process. Now, of course, if this occurs for pathological reasons, um, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, and uh, somebody who has this pathological condition will be chronically acidic, acidosis is what we would call it, and in that case, they actually are going to have problems with oxygen saturation, not just because they can't breathe as effectively, but also because the acidity changes um, unloading and loading. So that's problematic. Temperature is also part of this, okay? So temperature is going to increase the rate of chemical reactions. And so if the chemical reaction that we're referring to is this one, um, that is going to change, okay? And the rate of hemoglobin and oxygen, oxygen dissociating from hemoglobin will increase. It actually will push the chemical reaction in this direction toward the, toward the left. Um, I don't have a, f a graph for that. Instead, I just have the um, 
pH one, which is kind of a bummer. So this is not, not oxygen, but still the same as, as our muscles heat up, it will also cause a shift to the right. 